What's going on, online community? Uh, my name is Nate, and I'm so excited that you're here. I have the honor of serving as one of the pastors here at The Rock Church. We are continuing our series, uh, Empowered, Journey Through the Book of Acts, and we're really focusing on how the Holy Spirit empowers us. Today, the theme is how we are empowered to live transformed. And so, in Acts chapter 9, where the focus is today, we actually see Saul's conversion to Paul. And um, I have my awesome friends here with me. <laughs> hey. And so um, one thing I wanted to mention to you guys as before we get into the service is that we actually see, obviously, Saul, his conversion to Paul, but we also see Ananias, who's like mm. a key player mm. as well. Right. Um, and the cool thing about Ananias' obedience is that he gets to witness firsthand Saul's like little physical uh, transformation. Mm. Um, he's obedient. The Lord tells him to go and visit this guy, Saul. He's a little hesitant at first, but he goes and he does it anyway. And he literally gets to see the scales because Saul is blind at this point, sees the scales fall from his eyes. Right. Um, and sometimes for us, you know, in the context of our lives, sometimes it's really powerful to see the transformation of those around us. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to ask you guys, do you have somebody that you know um, where you've been able to see or witness like that transformation in? Yeah, I do, I do. Okay. I have a, a friend of mine, her name is Sammy, and mm -hmm. um, we started meeting at home just like this. And we were meeting just to have D group. And it's awesome to see how powerful it is to be in a place like this, where it's just a few of us doing something together, talking about life. Mm -hmm. She came to D group and started, she was so quiet, so super, super shy, <laughs> super quiet, super shy. And um, with within the time being together with, with the help with everybody in the in the room, um, she was able to become this amazing woman who now encourages everybody, yeah, prays for everybody. So good. It's really quick to talk and really quick to say what she has in her mind. And, um, and and I can see how the transformation needed to happen because then later on, now she's struggling with her mom having cancer, but you can see her wow. being the encourager now. Yeah. So it, it, the transformation was amazing. I um, love that. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. Well, hey, online family. We recognize that transformation is happening here at our church and around the world. And uh, we'll join you after the service. Church, come on. Shout out to everybody tuning in online, Rock Church Anywhere. We're excited. We know you're wa watching from all over the country, all over the world, and we're blessed to have you with us. And to everybody in the room, Rock Church Point Loma, come on, give yourselves a hand for coming out today. Hey, Amen. We love y'all. We love y'all. So my name is Santiago, and I'm the men's pastor here at the Rock Church. Shout out to the men. Come on, men. Clap it up, men. And I got to tell you guys, I'm really excited for what we got coming up in October. October 22nd is the Ignite Men's Conference. Come on, clap it up. Clap it up for the men. There's the slide. Listen. And if you're online, you need to register too because you need to fly in. You don't want to miss this thing. We got Pastor Miles speaking. We have John Bevere from Messenger International coming to bless the house. And if you don't know who John is, Google him. Look him up on YouTube. I promise you, you'll be blessed. We want you guys to sign up for the conference. There's an early bird special happening for the next few weeks, so take advantage of that. We got a table in the lobby. There's some guys there that can help you get connected and sign up for the conference, so don't miss that. And I know I'm the men's pastor, but I can't leave the ladies out. Come on, somebody. So come on, women's ministry. Come on, clap it up for women's ministry. They have a conference too. You see the slide up there, Saturday, September 17th right here at Point Loma Rock Church. So please, ladies, there's a, a women's ministry table in the lobby. Uh, go check them out. Get some information on how to register for that. If you're online, you can go to scrock.com slash women's and get all of that information. But please, take advantage of these things because we don't do things, we don't do events just to do them. The whole point is that we grow, amen? That we're growing, that we're moving along the, the spectrum of discipleship, becoming more like Christ, and these are two of the ways that we're helping men and women do that, so please take advantage, amen? I wanna shout out my wife. I don't know if she's in the room. Actually, I think she's serving with the women's ministry today, but uh, I just wanna thank my wife and my family for blessing me and allowing me to come and do what God has called me to do. We got four kids, y'all. Yeah, you can clap it up for that. We got four kids, and I know this morning she was getting them all ready by herself, so God bless her. Give her some extra coffee today in Jesus' name. 
<laughs> so I'm going to pray for us, and then we're going to jump right into the word this morning. Lord, we, uh, we thank you this morning. I thank you for everybody that is here in person, that is tuning in online, Lord. And we pray today for revelation in your word, Lord. I pray today that whoever is here, whoever is watching online, Lord, would hear the words, the exact things that you need to speak to them. Lord, would you transform their hearts today, Lord, we pray for your word to penetrate the hearts of every person under the sound of my voice today. We love you, Lord, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. 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 Well, if you've been following us the last few weeks, you know that we've been in a series called Empowered. And what we're discovering in this series is that we are empowered by the Holy Spirit to do many different things. And if you're a first-time guest or you're tuning in online for the first time and you're like, great, right out the gate, we're talking about the Holy Spirit. Is this one of those churches? Yes. Come on, somebody. Yes. Hey, we believe in the power of the Holy Spirit, the fruit of the Holy Spirit, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. We believe that the Holy Spirit is active in the lives of every believer. Come on, he's not weird. He's not scary. He's the third person of the Trinity. Amen? Amen. And we're not shy about talking about him. We, 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 we thank God for the Holy Spirit and that we can learn and teach about how he serves us in our lives. Amen? In Acts chapter 1, actually before Jesus ascended into heaven, he told his disciples, he said, wait, don't go do anything. Wait for the promise of my Father in heaven because not many days from now, you're going to be baptized or immersed or filled or consumed with the Holy Spirit. And, and when that happens, Jesus said, you would receive power. And you would receive power for what? To be my witnesses to everybody in the world. And so that's what we're talking about. The Holy Spirit is a promise for everybody. And it's so that we would be empowered to be a witness to the people around us. So the title of my message today is Empowered to Live a Transformed Life. If the same spirit that rose Christ from the dead lives in us, then we can't stay the same. The cost was too high for us to stay the same. Jesus died an excruciating death. He was beaten. He was whipped. He was tortured. His body was ripped apart. And he hung on a cross. Not just so that we could get a ticket to heaven. No. Jesus didn't die and raise from the dead so that we could get to heaven he died and rose from the dead so that heaven could get into us. Come on, somebody. He died and rose from the dead so that heaven could get into us. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Our job as disciples, as followers of Christ, is to bring heaven to earth. Amen? So if you're taking notes, and somebody told me, they said, hey, note takers are history makers. Come on, somebody. Note takers are history makers. Why? Because they take the things that they're hearing from God, they write them down, they meditate on them, and they put them into action. And that changes the world. Amen? So if you're taking notes, here's, here's the big idea. Here's the whole enchilada, as I say it. The Holy Spirit has empowered every believer. That's you. That's me. That's every person that has given their life to Jesus to live a transformed life so that we can be a witness to the world around us. The transformed life is a new life. We're born again, as the scripture says. In John chapter 3, Jesus is talking to this guy, Nicodemus. He's a religious leader, and he's trying to explain that there's a, a born-again state, that we must be born again. And he says this in verse 3, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. The Apostle Paul, who we're going to study today, he said that if anyone is in Christ, if you've put your faith in Jesus, that person is a new creation. Amen? He said, the old things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. So being born again means that you've received a new life by faith in Jesus, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, we are transformed in this new life, and our old life has passed away. In fact, today is Baptism Sunday. Come on, clap it up for baptisms. And a bunch of folks are being water baptized today. This is the step of discipleship 
where we actually bury the old person. Romans 6 talks about that. We are buried in Christ and we rise into new life. And so in baptism, we see that picture happening where you go down in the water and your old life is gone. It's buried with Christ. And when you come up, you're a new creation and you walk in the fullness of what that means. So we're praying today that many of you would take that step and say that this old life has to die and I'm going to leave it in the water. Amen? Come on, somebody. So here's the problem. In the beginning, when you, get, when, you, when you give your life to Jesus, we surrender our lives to Christ, there's, there's often a conflict that we experience. There's the old man coming into conflict with the new man. So for me, how many people in here been to life class? Raise your hand if you've done life class. Hey, come on now, clap it up for life class. Anybody got the shirt on? Who's wearing the shirt? Anybody? There's always somebody. Hey, up there in life class, that's right. If you haven't seen it, the, the, the shirt says live in the life. And so back in the day when I first got saved, my wife and I did life class and we went, got the shirt. I'm like, ooh, this is nice, live in the life. So my friend who was a DJ, he said, hey, I got my first gig downtown. And I'm like, cool, I'll go to that. So there I am downtown in a bar with a drink wearing the live in the life t-shirt. Come on, somebody. We keep it real up in here. So I was in there and I was doing my thing and you know, the DJ gets hooked up on the drink. So I'm like, I'm with him, that's my boy. And we're hanging out and there was a moment in that bar where I stopped and I looked down and I was holding the drink and I saw the shirt and something inside of me said, this, this isn't right. This doesn't feel right. In that moment, there was a conflict between the old man and the new man. The Holy Spirit brought conviction in my heart and said, son, this is, this is the end of that life. This old life you've been living, this party life, this going out to the clubs, no, 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 it's, it's not going to happen that way anymore. Why? Because the Holy Spirit has empowered every believer to live a transformed life, to be a witness to the world around us. So today I'm gonna give us three ways that we are transformed by the Holy Spirit. If we've truly surrendered our lives to Jesus, these are like some checkpoints that we can assess in our lives to see how we're doing. So first is that there's spiritual transformation. This is the internal transformation. This is the invisible proof that we've, been, we've become a new creation. The second point is that there's social transformation. So this is external proof that something is different in our lives. And the third point is that there's supernatural transformation. That's the result. That's the expression of the kingdom coming out of us as believers. This is what it all boils down to. This is where the rubber hits the road, if you ask me. And so for our passage today, we're going to be in Acts chapter 9. Anybody got a physical Bible in here? Just put it up. Put it up. The saints are in the house today. Come on. <laughs> Hey, I'm a digital guy. I, I got my Bible apps and all that stuff. But uh, recently I've been drawn to the physical Bible. It's something about those early mornings. You got a nice cup of coffee. It's quiet. Kids are still sleeping. And you just, you just hear that page turn. Amen? Amen. Come on. So, <laughs> that's good. So we're going to be in Acts chapter 9. And we're going to see, we're going to study perhaps the most significant example of a transformed life. This is the life of Paul, and we know him. Uh, before he was Paul, he was Saul, and he's one of the most formative figures in the church. He's responsible for founding and establishing early churches all across the Roman Empire, and he authored most of the New Testament books, many of them that we have in here. So he's a significant figure, but that wasn't always the case. And see, he was actually the complete opposite of what I just described. And in the beginning of Acts chapter 9, we see Scripture tell us that Saul was breathing out murderous threats against the disciples of Jesus. He wanted to kill them. He was coming against them. He wanted to throw them in jail. He wanted to come against the church any way that he could. And what he did is he went to the religious leaders and he said, hey, I want authority to go to this town called Damascus and I'm going to go and round up all the Christians. And we're going to bring them back and we're going to throw them in jail because this is not going to happen on my watch. Amen. Paul was about that life and he was coming against the church. 
So we're going to pick it up in Acts chapter 9, starting with verse 3. And it says this. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. You see, even Saul had to be born again. He was about to have this spiritual transformation that would begin his journey to become the man of God that he was created to be and to take the gospel further than it had ever gone. So our first point today is that we're empowered for spiritual transformation. Every single person in this room, every single person watching online, if you've been born a physical birth, you must be born again. It's not negotiable. This isn't a suggestion. It's not a good idea. It's not if I get around to it. No, this is a must if you want to be a disciple of Jesus. This is truly the first step to a transformed life. There's a pathway to being a disciple. And the first step to getting on the pathway is to be born again, to surrender your life to Jesus and say, I don't know everything, but you do, and I trust you with my life. So let's see what this looks like in the life of Paul. Back in Acts chapter 9, now he's in Damascus. He's blind, and he hasn't eaten for three days. He's been told by the Lord to stay in a house and pray. And in verse 10, we're introduced to a disciple named Ananias. Ananias was a bad dude, and we're going to see why in just a minute. The Lord speaks to Ananias in a vision. He says, go to this house on a street called Straight, and you'll find this guy named Saul from Tarsus. He'll be praying, and in a vision, he's seen you coming to lay hands on him so that he may regain his sight. And Ananias, and Ananias says, what? <laughs> uh... Lord, we, we heard about this guy, Saul. We, we know what he was doing in Jerusalem. He was persecuting the Christians. He was the guy standing there when they stoned Stephen, approving of it. Are you sure you want me to go and pray for him? So let's look at it, Acts chapter 9, verse 17, and it says this. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again. He got up and was baptized. One of my favorite things about this story is that Ananias wasn't an apostle. He, he was just a disciple. We don't really know he, if he was a leader, if he was an associate campus pastor. We don't know if he had an outreach ministry. We don't know who he was other than the fact that he was a disciple. God is looking for faithful people just like Ananias that he can count on to handle his business. Paul needed to be born again and Ananias was the disciple that went to make it happen. Not only did he lay hands on him so that he could receive his sight, but it says that he baptized him in water and that he was filled with the Holy Spirit. I believe that there's some Ananiases in the room today. I believe that there's some Ananiases tuning in online right now. God is looking for you to be the Ananias in someone's life, to be the conduit for someone else's spiritual transformation. Matthew chapter 18, the Great Commission, we all know it. It says this, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. This is Jesus speaking. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to observe and obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Jesus commissioned us. He commissioned the disciples to go and baptize the nations. Jesus told the disciples, and then now we have it in Scripture as a commission to us as believers that we're to go out and make disciples of the nations and baptize people. Come on, somebody. Being a disciple starts with spiritual transformation. For me and my wife, our life, uh, it was good before we got saved. We, you know, were living our lives. We had our house. We were college graduates, and we were doing 
pretty good by the world standards and, and I was no reason to seek the Lord. We were just living life. But I was that guy and, I, and we grew up Catholic, uh, that, so we'd go to service once in a while, um, <laughs> once a quarter, and um, the plate would come by and, and I wouldn't put $20 in that thing. I'm like, they ain't getting my money. <laughs> but I had no problem going to the club Saturday night and spending four, five, six hundred bucks on bottle service. Some of y'all know what that's like. Just run it up, man. Let's go. And, and that was my life. But God changed everything. And you can see the picture up there. November 9th, 2014. Come on, right here. That's right here. That's right here. That was the day that I got saved. That's the day that I got born again. I got baptized in water shortly after that. I got baptized in the Holy Spirit shortly after that. And I started to be discipled. That was the key for me, for the transformation in my life. The key was to get discipled, to have some other people around me that are doing things differently, that are living for the kingdom so that I could see it and learn and then start to do it myself. So my challenge to everyone in the room today is to think about your spiritual transformation. Everybody online, think about your born again state. Do you know if you're born again? Is there evidence in, internally that you are different, that you're a new creation? And if your answer is no, if your answer is I'm not sure, then I ask you this, what are you waiting for? What are you waiting for? It, the time is now, amen? The time is today and I'm praying that many of you in this room today and online are going to have the revelation that I need to be born again. And since we're doing baptisms today, might as well do that too. Because as we look in Scripture, especially through the book of Acts, we see that it happened at the same time. People repented, they were baptized, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. They repented, they were baptized, and they fi were filled with the Holy Spirit. To repent is to change the way you think about something, and for us, it's about God and how we need to serve him and live for him. Amen? Amen? There's a song out right now. There's a line that says, stop looking for the evidence and start living in the promises. I think that's applicable to many of us today because we're searching and we're looking, but it's right here. It's already proven over 2,000 years that this is the truth. The evidence is there. Let's start living in the promises. Amen? Why? Because the Holy Spirit has empowered every believer to live a transformed life so that we can be a witness to the world around us, and that starts with spiritual transformation. The next point is that we are empowered for social transformation. So what does this mean? This is the external evidence, right? There should be some proof in our lives about how we're living for God. What are people saying about you? What is the social narrative of your life according to other people. This is your testimony. Every believer has one. And it goes like this. Before I met Jesus, my life looked like this. Then I met Jesus and I gave my life to him and now my life looks totally different. Amen? The last eight weeks we've seen pastors come up here as Pastor Miles has been on vacation and we're praying for you, Pastor, that uh, you're rested and refreshed and coming back with some fire for us. Come on, somebody. <laughs> Amen. But we've seen different pastors come up here and, and as I watch the messages and they're all my friends and we're all on the same squad and we love each other and we pray for each other, it's been amazing to see that unfold and be shared up here by different people, different walks of life, coming from different places, but the same story. Before God, I was like this, then I met Jesus, and now my life is totally different. And my prayer is that everyone in this room, everyone watching online, if you've been born again, you have that same story. So let's look at this in the life of Paul as we pick up our passage back in Acts 9, verse 26. And it says this, when he came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, not believing that he was really a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. He told them how Saul on his journey had seen the Lord and that the Lord had spoken to him and how in Damascus he had preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. So Saul stayed with them and moved about freely in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. See, Barnabas was a witness 
to Paul's transformed life. He could vouch for the new man that Paul had become. If we're truly born again, there should be a new story about the life we're living. We can't look the same. We can't sound the same as the old person that we used to be. We have to live that new life in Christ. So here's a little twist for you concerning this spiritual transformation. Let's jump to Acts 19 real quick. It'll be on the screen. This is one of my favorite passages in all of Scripture. Uh, this is Paul's third missionary journey. He's been doing some ministry already, healing and all kinds of stuff, people raising from the dead, and people knew who Paul was. They knew. He came into a town. They're like, oh, these dudes, this is a bad brother right here. So he comes to Ephesus, and then we're introduced to these guys that are named the seven sons of Sceva. They've been going around casting out demons, but they've been doing it saying, in the name of Jesus, who Paul preaches. So, see, they didn't, they didn't know Jesus themselves, but they knew that Paul did. So they said, this is the Jesus. We're using the authority of the Jesus that Paul knows, and we're going we're to see what happens. And the crazy thing is it was working. It was working. They're going around town. Yeah, in Jesus' name that Paul preaches, come out. And the demons were like, whoop. The crazy thing is, how, how does that work? Why? Why does it work? Because the name of Jesus is that powerful. Amen. Come on. God is good, amen? Come on. And if there's somebody out there doing God's work, God's going to be like, okay, I'll use that. I'll use that. I'll use that. But what happened is they came across a higher ranking demon. And this brother was like, who? Who, who are you? <laughs> Let's look at Acts 19, starting in verse 15. It says, one day the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, Paul I know about, but who are you? Then the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them and overpowered them all, and he gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. Whoo! Come on. We're talking about social reputation, right? We're talking about what are people saying about you. Well, that happens in two places. It happens here on earth. It also happens in heaven. Amen? It also happens in heaven. You see, Paul had a reputation among the people. We saw that in Barnabas. But these copycats were out here trying to do what he was doing. But he also had a reputation in hell. The demons knew who Paul was. So our social transformation happens, come on somebody, in heaven and on earth. And there should be fruit. There should be proof of that in your life. What kind of authority are we expressing if we truly represent the kingdom? See, for me, back in the day, talking about this social transformation, we used to get crazy. And uh, not yet, not yet, not yet. Hold up on that picture, man. <laughs> yeah. We used to have these pool parties in, in my house. It wasn't big, but it lo kind of looked big. And so people would be like, oh, yeah, man, it's Manchester Street. So they said, oh, Manchester Mansion. We're going to call this Manchester Mansion. And I was like, whatever. It kind of caught on. And we would, like, have parties. And we printed towels. And we had all kinds of stuff going on. And um, we even had a, had a drink that we coined. It was called the Manchester Mai Tai. And it was a shot. And everybody knew it. They come over. They're like, hey, what's up with the Manchester Mai Tais? I'm like, oh, I got you, man. Come here. And that was our reputation. That's how people knew us. Amen? You can put that picture up now. That's a picture from one of the parties. Come on. We're going to keep it real up in here. That's me, Rambo, taking shots at my house. That was the old person. But God, come on, somebody. God had a different plan for me. And what the enemy meant for evil, having that house with the pool, eventually got shifted into kingdom business. Go ahead and throw up that next picture. And we went from bottle service to baptisms. Come on, somebody. We went from bottle service to baptisms. That's me getting baptized in my own pool, the same pool that we used to have crazy parties. Now we were doing baptisms in. Show that other picture up there. That's our, uh, one of our early life groups uh, in the next picture that you're going to see. Uh, we, we used to have crazy parties. Now we're doing Bible studies at the house. That was happening. And I remember people would say, oh, he'll be back. This is just a phase. We've seen it before. He's, he's hurting, so he's looking for God, but he'll be back. And those same people today are probably still saying the same thing. But you know what? For me, I know there's no going back. This is it. This is a new life. Come on, somebody. This is a new life. My wife got baptized there. A bunch of other people got baptized there. 
and now we're doing kingdom business at our house. Amen? Amen. So here's what we do. We take an inventory of, our, of the social narrative in our lives. So if I ask you, what does your feed look like on Facebook, on Instagram, on whatever, right? What are people saying about you? What do your DMs look like? Oh, I'm in your business now. Come on. What do your DMs look like? What are people asking you? Would, would people in your life be surprised to know that you're a believer? Would they be surprised to know your coworkers if you say, you know, I'm a Christian? Would they be like, really? <laughs> nah. Not you. We need to take an inventory of our lives because here's the problem. The world is bold enough. The world is bold enough. We got to be bold as believers, as Christians, as followers of Jesus. We got to be bold enough to stand up and say, no, no, no. This is what I believe. This is what I base my life on. Nothing else. And I'm not afraid. I'm not ashamed to talk about it. Come on. Romans 1.16 says, For I am unashamed of the gospel of Christ, because it is the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes. So when we stand on the word, when we proclaim our life, and we live the way God has commanded us to live, it's a witness to the world around us, because we've been empowered to live this transformed life for those very people around us. And they should see it in the way we walk, in the way we talk, in the way we live, in the way we do everything. Amen? Amen? Amen. Come on. Amen. Yes. Our last point today is that we are empowered for supernatural transformation. If you've been born again and you've been filled with the Holy Spirit and now you've been baptized in water, there should be some supernatural activity in your life. I'm not saying that's the formula, but it's probably consistent with anybody who's moving in the spirit. They've done those early things and they've committed their lives to discipleship and to learning and to growing and to pursuing the presence and the person of God. This is normal Christianity, folks. It's not reserved for the pastors or the leaders or the deacons or the elders. This is for everybody. Mark 16 says that these are the signs that would follow those who believe that they will cast out demons, they will speak with new tongues, they will lay hands on the sick and they will recover, they will not be hurt by any demonic powers or anything like that that comes against them. They would be about the kingdom business. This is the stuff that should be happening in our lives every day, expanding the kingdom of God here on earth. And to anyone, and I've heard it before, well, you know, Mark 16, it wasn't in the original manuscript, so we don't really talk about that. You know what? If you don't think that it, it's in the original manuscripts, you don't think it's supposed to be part of the word, how about this? Tear it out your Bible. Anybody willing to do that? Tear it out your Bible. Throw it away. I don't think there's one person in this room that would be willing to do that. So come on, let's go for it. Let's believe what the word says. Amen? So let's pick up our testimony of Paul again. And for this, we're going to go to Acts 28. And here's... The backdrop. So Paul's a prisoner. He's been shipwrecked on this island called Malta. And the, the natives come and they build a fire because they're cold. And they're all sitting there. And Paul's standing there. And a viper comes out of the fire and it bites Paul in the hand. And he shakes it off. He's like, get off me. And the people see it and they're like, oh, this dude's going to die. Obviously, he just got bit by a viper. But he didn't. And they marveled and they said, man, this guy's a god. So pick it up in verse 7. Here we are. There was an estate nearby that belonged to Publius, a chief official of the island. He welcomed us to his home and showed us generous hospitality for three days. His father was sick in bed, suffering from fever and dysentery. Real quick, do y'all know what dysentery is? I didn't know. I had to look it up. And it's an intestinal infection that usually results in diarrhea. I was like, ugh, there's an old diarrhea demon up in here. That's what it was, a diarrhea demon. All right, we're back, we're back. So Paul went in to see him, and after prayer, he placed his hands on him and he healed him. When this happened, the rest of the sick on the island came and were cured. They honored us in many ways, and when we were ready to sail, they furnished us with the supplies that we needed. Paul was about that kingdom life. Everywhere he went, he rode like this. What's amazing about this passage is that the provision they needed to carry on their journey came as a result of his obedience to walk in this kind of life, to be available and to be there, to pray for people, to bring the kingdom, to bring healing, to bring restoration, to bring peace, to bring all the things 
that are promises for us as a display to other people. So this could mean that for some of us in here, your blessing, your answered prayer could be on the other side of obedience. It could be on the other side of you stepping out and saying, I'm going to be an Ananias for somebody in my life, for somebody in my family. That thing you've been praying about that you're believing God for, God's like, I want to give it to you. I want you to just, I want you to be an expression of me to people. And that's going to flow from there. Come on, God is waiting for you to sow a seed of obedience so you can reap a harvest of provision. This is the supernatural life that we're called to live. Everyday Christianity should look like this. Back in Acts 19, we read about Paul uh, in verse 11. It says this, he did, God did extraordinary miracles through Paul so that even the handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched him were taken to the sick and their illnesses were cured and evil spirits left them. Come on. This is the kind of stuff that we should be going after. We should be getting after it. I got this sweaty rag. Anybody want it? No, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. But we should go after it. Pray for people. I've prayed for a bunch of people for healing, and they didn't get healed. But I've also prayed for a bunch of people for healing, and they did get healed. And I never would have seen that happen. We never would have experienced the move of God if I just sat by idly and said, that's not for me. It's for everyone. There's opportunities in front of us every day to express the supernatural power of God. We're the conduit and God does the work. Don't worry about it because it's God that moves. We're just the conduit. But there's a cost to living that supernatural life. There's a cost to doing something supernaturally for Jesus. And what does it cost? It costs early morning prayer. It costs spending time in the word. It costs getting training and getting equipped to understand how to use the, the spiritual gifts of God and to walk in the fruit of the Spirit. There's no shortcuts to greatness. Come on, you can't have the oil if you don't have the toil. Come on, you can't have the oil if you don't have the toil. There's a cost. There's a transformation in your life that God is saying, you have to be an example of me to the rest of the world. So if you need help, get it. Get in a kingdom group, kingdom life group. Get in a men's group. Get in a women's group. Come to Encounter in November right here at Point Loma. Learn about these things and grow. Be around community. There's a quote that says that you are the average of the five people that you spend the most time with. What do those people look like? Are they kingdom people? Are they moving in the gifts of God? Are they growing in their understanding of the word? Because you're going to look just like them. So get around some people that are doing kingdom things. Why? Because we are empowered to live a transformed life so that we can be a witness to the world around us. Yes, Remember that time I told you I was in the bar uh, with my buddy? He was a DJ. Well, that was him in the picture. And he was my, he's my best friend. We grew up together, uh, elementary school and all through high school. And we've known each other for a long time. I was the best man in his wedding. And uh, he was the first, one of the first people I, I brought to church when I got saved. I'm like, man, my boy, he's, he's got to get saved. And I brought him here and we sat right over here. I took him to the area where I was when I got saved. I'm like, it's going to rub off on him. And we get here and uh, worship was good, was great. And, and then we sit down for the message and some other pastor walks in and I'm like, ah, oh, where's Miles? I'm like, he's definitely not getting saved now. <laughs> That's probably what y'all said when I walked out here. It's okay. It's okay. Long story short, he didn't get saved that day, but a seed was planted. And I kept encouraging him. I kept loving him. I kept being there for him. And I remember when his grandpa died, he called me and he wanted prayer and I prayed for him. And every time I would come and see him, I would encourage him. And I remember he was cutting my hair one day and he's like, back was hurting. I prayed for him and, and God did something in his back. And he's just kind of looking at me like, what? And, and, and I was there for him. When he was going through things with his wife, I was there for him. I encouraged him. I prayed for him. And one day I was driving home from church and he moved to Texas and he's out there working. And uh, I remember he told me, he said, man, I got, I got a, I'm in this barbershop and it's all Christians. They're Christian barbers. The owner is a, like a pastor. I was like, ooh, come on, Jesus. Yes. And so I, I didn't, I didn't want to mess it up. I didn't want to say, I said, great, man. Praise God. I said, if you have questions, call me. But that's awesome. And one day I was driving home 
from church, and the Lord said, call him. Call him. And so I called him, and we're talking, and sure enough, he starts sharing some stuff, and he was going through it. And, uh, and I, I heard the Holy Spirit say, he's ready. He's ready to receive the gospel. His heart is prepared. And so I, they're on the phone. He's in Texas. I'm in front of my parents' house. I was picking up my kids. And I just said, man, I, I want to share something with you. And I, I shared it with you before. You've heard it before, but this time is different. And I shared the gospel with him, and he got saved, and he gave his life to Jesus that day. Come on, somebody. And now his wife with my wife gave her life to the Lord and they're living in Texas and God is blessing them. They got a new house and they're doing well and they just brought their baby girl home from the hospital and God has been moving in his life. Why? Why? Because we are empowered by the Holy Spirit to live a transformed life so that we can be a witness to the world around us. We experience the spiritual transformation the social transformation, the supernatural transformation so that the world around us can see Jesus. So family, today, I want to pray for us as we close. And I'm believing God that there's people in the room that were just like me. I walked in here, I didn't know anything. I didn't have a Bible. I didn't know what I was doing here except I was coming to look for God. And I believe there's people in this room, there's people online right now where you're in that same boat. And this is going to be your first time you've ever prayed, a, made a profession of faith in Jesus. And it's going to change your life, just like it did mine right here years ago. There's other people in the room where you've done that before, but you know that your life don't look like that. Your social narrative is not pointing to Jesus. It's pointing to something else. And you've been struggling, you've been wrestling with that conflict of the new man that's in there. It's in there. But your old man is still pulling you this way. And I believe today that's going to break free as we pray and you come and surrender it at the altar. Amen. So this is what we're going to do. Every head bowed, every eye closed. I'm going to pray for two groups of people. And when I'm done, I'm going to invite all of you to come up to the front. And if we have the, a prayer team, y'all can come out um, so we can have some people ready to pray. So if you're in that first group, this is your first time, I'm going to pray this prayer and you're going to repeat it. There's no magic in the words. This is a heart condition. So if your heart is ready to surrender your life, this is for you. Say, Lord Jesus, I admit that I'm a sinner. I admit that I am far from you, that I don't have a relationship with you and, and that I don't even understand it. But I believe today that you died on the cross for my sins, that you were beaten, that you were broken, that you hung on the cross for me, that my sins could be forgiven, could be washed clean as if they never happened, and that I could be restored to a right relationship with my Father in heaven. And so I confess now, Jesus, that you are the Lord of my life. And I surrender everything to you. And I ask right now that you fill me with your presence, with your Holy Spirit. Baptize me fresh now in the Holy Spirit. Because I desire to live a transformed life for you. Amen. Second group of people. You've prayed that before. And you know there's, there's some change inside of you. But it's not being expressed fully outwardly. And you got some stuff that's clinging to you from this old life. If you want to break that off today, repeat this prayer in the privacy of your heart. Say, Lord Jesus, I love you. I know that I belong to you, but I've allowed the enemy to have a grip on my soul, a grip on my life. But today, I come boldly into your presence and I ask that you break every chain of addiction. You break every chain of sinfulness. You break every thought pattern that is leading me away from you. That you remove people from my life that are drawing me away from you. And I surrender again my life to you. And I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would empower me to live a transformed life in Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed either of those prayers, I want you to stand up right now. Stand to your feet. Come on. Stand to your feet. Stand to your feet. Come on, Jesus. Yes. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Come on. All over the room. Praise God.
Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Come on. If you're standing, I want to invite you to come up. Come up to the front. Don't be shy. Come on. This is the biggest moment of your life. Come on. Come on. Amen, sister. Praise God. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on, Jesus. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Amen. Amen. Come on. Come on, brother. Praise God. Come on. Come on. Come on. Yeah. Jesus. Freedom right now. Freedom. Freedom. Freedom in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Amen. 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 God bless y'all. Come on. Come on, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Well, hey, online family. If you made the decision uh, to give your life to Christ, we invite you to text SAVED to 52525 or visit sdrock.com slash saved. As we close out this service, um, we're gonna continue on the theme of transformation. And actually, we're gonna be talking about it within the context of community. And I gotta shout out my boy, Pastor Vince. Hey. We love you, bro. Hey. Well, no. um, we got the rest of our community here, just within the circle. And we don't have Vince no. because it's his birthday. Yeah. Yeah. We gave so, him a day so off. So kind to give him a day off. Yeah, so kind. We're so kind. <laughs> but he is definitely like an important part of our community. Absolutely, um, yes. And so he's inspiring the, the theme of just uh, transformation within the context of community. Mm, right. um, yeah. Obviously we have Pastor Vince, and um, we want to talk about more so, like, maybe just highlight some people within our community. Right. Um, and just the transformation in their lives and how community um, really, you, even as you said earlier, right, like community has such a powerful role mm -hmm. in moving us along in our transformation. Obviously, Christ is at the center of that. Um, but I was even thinking within the context of, like, um, I'm pretty plugged into my gym as well, so I get to, like, mm -hmm. coach and train people at our mm -hmm. local gym. And even just... Um, Maybe y'all can relate to this, but uh, during the pandemic, I tried working out in my garage. Not happening. <laughs> Boring. Right? Boring. And by myself, and like I could just stop whenever I wanted to. I could pause the yeah. music whenever I wanted to. But right. when you're at like a local gym and you have people mm -hmm. around you, yeah. encouraging you, yeah, yeah, yeah. you literally get to see the transformation take place. And it's like slow. It's not like instant, you know, transformation, mm -hmm. but it's like slow, consistent. And it's cool because you have people encouraging you. Yeah. Right. And over like, you know, X amount of days, years, whatever, you get to see this transformation is really cool and you're doing it within mm. the context of community. Mm -hmm. um, how have you guys seen transformation within that context of like a community and doing life together? First of all, I can totally relate. I, I work out a little harder when, when uh, there's, there's people, people watching, right? People watching. <laughs> like good that motivation. Yeah, don't give up. Don't keep going. But uh, as you're saying uh, about people and transformation, I mean that's what it's about, right? Mm -hmm. And it can be this giant leap or these tiny baby steps, but all of it matters. And I think of uh, our really good friend Michaela. Oh, hey, yeah. shout out. Yeah. You know, she's one of our back. one of our online hosts, very faithful. Mm -hmm. I remember when her mom introduced her to me. It was so. Random, like I was, we met on Easter Sunday, and her mom was like, "You need to talk to my daughter." And from that moment, wow. um, I just saw such a hunger and mm -hmm. a commitment and right. just willingness, right? Like both of us are both on th this journey still, mm -hmm. but she was like, "Yeah, I." I want to grow. Mm -hmm. I want to continue to transform. And she went from this like quiet, just post grad little girl. No, wow. I'm kidding. No, she's not little. She was always no. she's always had a strong voice, yeah, but I she think has. she's growing to use it yeah, more and is. more. Yes, yeah, and, I agree. Um, yeah, and to see her now today. With, Powerhouse. Oh, yes, exactly. She's she yeah. she yeah. running the Freedom, the freedom yeah, Center situation, yeah. right? So yeah. um, just really encouraged to see just all the steps. Going from someone who kind of like what you shared earlier, questioning her mm -hmm. path and, mm -hmm. and where God was leading her mm -hmm. to where she is today, really kind of setting her, her flag down. And, and um, I know she'd always, always had a heart for the marginalized and the oppressed. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, look at her, look now. At her today. Yeah, Go I ahead, love that. Mac. Yeah. That's so good. Yeah, someone who is like inspiring us tremendously, who is not even necessarily here physically at mm -hmm. our campuses, but is away is Teresa M. Yeah, Arizona. Yay. We love Yay. Teresa. So every week <laughs> on. I would out go on the, online and watch, and every week she would write something like, oh, tuning yeah. in from Arizona, oh, I miss my rock family, yes. and she does it faithfully every single mm -hmm. week, had the opportunity to meet her here at Point Loma, but I know she's doing a lot of transformational mm -hmm. work in her city, right? She yeah. is, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so y'all might yeah. know this. She came to um, Toys for Joy in San Marcos. She did. <laughs> Take notes. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> Teresa, I know you're watching. We see you, we recognize yeah. you, we love you. 
Um, she was actually part of the local campuses here. Right. Moved to Arizona, just really ad adopted that like do something mindset. And so she does something yes. uh, very similar to Toys for Joy. And she does it in Arizona. She gets a bunch of donations, raises awareness, and people come and around Christmas time, it's literally like a Toys for Joy 2.0 in Arizona, which That's is so awesome. Cool. That's awesome. So she does cool. like food pantry ministry. She sends us photos wow. and gives us updates. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, we recognize Teresa, we, we love her. Um, and that's definitely like a great example of like community transformation, right. wherever you're at, whether it's here locally, Arizona, or around the world, wherever we're yeah. at. So. We, love we you know she's, yeah. she's not the only one, right? There's, no, there's a exactly. ton of people. So, yeah. I mean, yeah. if, you haven't, if you haven't put a shout out in the chat, right? Yeah, yeah, I think that's good, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So actually, here's what we're gonna do. Um, Drop a comment below. We know we have a lot of people engaging online from around the world. We have a bunch of amazing people like Michaela, like, like Teresa, Teresa yeah. come on now. So first of all, we recognize you, we love you guys. And second, um, we would love for you, uh, the rest of our online community, drop a comment uh, below of what's going on in your local community. How can we pray for you? How can we encourage you? Um, how can we hear more about the ministry that is happening in your backyard um, because really at the end of the day we want you to recognize like we're all one big rock church family uh from around the globe so we love you guys thanks again for joining us and um for all happenings and things rock church make sure to follow us on all of our platforms uh, at the rock san diego or also visit online at sdr.com see y'all have a great day